let's uh, give a very brief outline about uh, our company, which is a biomarker. A biomarker uh, has been existed for more than 15 years. At the time we established the company, the biomarker is not a buzzword at all, unlike today, okay? <laughs> so, but however, our company focus on the molecular biology of the aging. Uh, our goal is to prevent the diseases and uh, prolong the healthy human lifespan. So through the whole years of the course of the development, we established the gene expression database and based on a longevity model, which is a caloric restriction. And this model has been, uh, is, you know, sort of a studied uh, from 80 something years ago. That was the first time the paper was published. But no one knows what are the mechanism. But we knew that's a significant systematic effect, which is under the caloric restriction, the diseases have been retarded and the lifespan has been extended. So since the, uh, the gene chips was born, and we will be able to identify from the whole genome what are those genes to be regulated when the model was on caloric restriction. So which gave us a so-called biomarker, I would say the guideline, and it is through the whole analysis of process and what are those genes linked to certain pathways associated with certain diseases and contributed to the aging process, which our goal is to develop the products instead of the practice of caloric restriction and we try to use the mechanism which I identified, the cellular pathways we have established, and based on our, uh, you know, the uh, gene expression database, and searching for the products to intervene the aging process. That's our goal, to extend the human uh, healthy lifespan, okay? Thank you, Xi, for a great introduction. Um, my name is Lana Fan. I, I have a disclaimer. I actually have moved on from um, personalized diagnostics. My new venture is actually an AI company called Huma.ai. We focus um, on accelerating clinical um, development um, using natural language. So um, just to add to your introduction, thank you very much. Yes, I um, spent over 20 years in um, healthcare, predominantly building business in precision medicine and sold one of them to Novartis, and um, kind of that's my conduit segue into the China market because you couldn't get samples out of China, so we had to, for all our global um, development programs, we had to find a local partner. That's kind of how I got reconnected, even though I was actually born in Beijing, China, but that's how I got reconnected back into the Chinese market. And, um, and I had my own company, Precision Personalized Diagnostics, really kind of developing um, products, diagnostics in China, and then also taking U.S. biotech companies into that big market. So um, during my career, you know, in healthcare, we're always dealing with large quantity of data, particularly with this explosion of um, genomics and precision medicine. This is actually becoming a huge problem. So um, that's kind of nice segue into my current company, which is um, really kind of connecting these disparate um, data systems, allowing people to just kind of ask questions in their natural language, like, where can I find my data? And then a uh, human will actually automatically um, get answers and then basically present it um, instantly to you. So um, the pain is that, you know, as you know, that now it takes about 10 years and $2.6 billion to develop a new drug. And of those 10 years, like six to seven years are spent on clinical trials. So this is a huge um, development cycle. And part of the problem is that you have all these protocol amendments. You know, if you miss or there's a uh, piece of misinformation, it sets you back. One amendment is like three to four months. And then typically for a study, there's two, three amendments. So you're really, your timeline sets back one year at minimum. So if you think about a whole development cycle is 10 years, that's a huge problem. So um, this is where we come in, actually. Um, you know, status quo is that, you know, clinical teams sit across the globe, that you have to collaborate, and then basically, you, you know, you go through your emails, your documents, your meeting minutes, and then it's really time
time-consuming and also error-prone. If you miss a piece of critical information, and then your protocol gets kicked back. So what we're doing is actually using this human language interface, and the scientists and clinical team can just say, okay, where is my dosing information? Right? And the human can actually crawl all these disparate systems and finding that answer to you. And then on top of it, we're actually a machine learning platform. So um, it's all about sort of iterative question and answer, right? You ask one question, you get back answers, and you ask another question. So this whole iterative process is actually a knowledge base. And then we can actually build that and also generate best practices for the organization. So we are startup, but we're post-launch and revenue plus. And um, we're going to make a million dollars this year. So it's really excited to be at this panel. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Ihan, and, and thank you for the outstanding introduction for me. Um, actually, I actually haven't graduated from Stanford yet. I'm actually working uh, in School of Medicine to do a little bit of a research project with Dr. N. Seng um, on uh, metabolic syndrome, but just for my own uh, own interest. Actually, I um, I came from a family business background from China. So our um, so JJK Health is actually a um, big data um, corporate wellness spinoff from a listed company called Meinian Jiankang, Meinian Jiankang, a stock listed company, and uh, and my family business is actually Tsuming Health Checkup. So um, what JJK is actually doing, we are actually in the front line of doing medical and healthcare services f based on big data um, analyzation. So um, the family business actually owns about 200 clinics across China, um, pretty much covers every single provinces. And um, to start off, JJK has this great honor of tw uh, 20 million plus of patient clinical visits data, but was all in traditional way of saving on a disk. So one of the huge job we have to do was to kind of digitalize and structuralize every single data. And when we were doing that, we realized just that job actually burned off a lot of money because it's not very revenue, you know. It, you can't really make out of it a lot of stuff. So that, was, that took a year or so. And, um, and then we kind of used that data and tagged each thing, and then we did precision medicine for each individual um, as follow-up. So what we did is actually, we positioned ourselves as a service company for these um, clinics to do later on follow-up to individual, as well as um, when we take business clients, like corporate clients, we also do corporate um, wellness for that. So that's two of our monetization lines. But, you know, like from the very beginning, as a listed company spinoff, until we find our own monetization way, that was actually a really long journey. Um, so that was that. And also the other part of um, my business is also for the fertility clinics. We also have fertility clinics in uh, New York, in San Francisco. Um, also, we have um, three hospitals in Hainan province as the um, medical tour, the special medical zone in China. Um, so that's another line of what we do. Um, and right now I'm just chilling in Stanford <laughs> trying to do my research with on, on, on metabolic syndrome, something that I'm interested at. In. Yeah, short abbreviation of my um, career. Thank you. Uh, it's very interesting and also very challenging, I know, uh, since I have worked in the US for 20 years in the, in the industry and uh, dealing with hospitals a lot. And knowing that, um, you know, the, the systems don't talk to each other, although there are stand, standards sometimes, uh, HL7 or CDs can, stuff like that uh, in doing clinical trials. But when it comes to EHR, EMR, all of those, uh, it is still big barriers uh, in terms of having a data interoperability not only from technical perspective, but mostly from patient privacy and the hospital property and all of those. So how does that project work in China? What kind of challenges do you encounter in uh, dealing with that? So um, I'm gonna answer uh, in two parts. So I wanted to say um, the EHR system in US and in China has very, very differences, a lot of differences. So to be really honest, the EHR and uh, personal health record actually have 
a lot more unified in US than in China. In China, actually, even the state, I mean, 90% are state-owned hospitals, and state-owned hospitals system doesn't talk to each other, right? And there's state-owned hospitals, there's private hospitals, there's private clinics, and they're all really fragmented. Um, JJK is built on a unified system, which is that particular 200 listed company privately, wholly privately owned. And that's one big system. That's why we can do things. But we're, we don't have the ambitions of expanding into the state-owned hospitals because, as everybody knows, many startups have tried in China. Many have failed. If the government doesn't try to do this in China, no one can actually break into the state-owned hospital and says, hey, how about I do technical support with you and you share the data with me? That's just not going to happen. Many people have tried and many people have failed. Um, so I think we have the same problem in U.S. and in China as well. But in U.S., I feel like the problem is harder to overcome because you guys have hard, um, better privacy, um, <laughs> better privacy and, and, and data ownership, right? The first thing we get trained is HIPAA when we, when we go into school, school of medicine. So, um, so, and also like giant healthcare institutes and giant like Kaiser Permanente like insurance companies, they have a lot of data and then big like like Harvard, right, and Stanford, right, Mayo Clinic, they don't really, they don't really go talk to each other and there's nothing much you can do about it as a third party service person but I feel like there are more opportunity in China in this side because at least we have the confidence of unifying the private hospitals, unifying the private clinics in China. That's exactly what we're doing. And also, um, the way physical examination works in China is very different because here you do insurance reimbursed physical examinations. In China, it is corporate paid as part of the employee benefit for an annual checkup. So it's out of pocket from the corporate, so it's actually easier. We just have to get down the corporate saying, you sign a deal with us, and then you come back for physical checkup next year. Right, that's, that's how we do it. So system is very, the fundamental system is very different. I would say there's actually more opportunity to streamline and get together these different um, fragmented data in China. And also, to be really honest, um, I'm being very straightforward here, right? Like, in China, you, your, your medical record or personal information leaks out all the time. So people are not, it's true, right? You get you get phone calls, right? I'm I'm really straightforward. You get phone calls in China, like telling you all sorts of stuff. So you know your your identification information leaks out somewhere. But then, if that happens in U.S. and for you know compared to U.S. citizens and Chinese citizens, Chinese citizens are actually less sensitive on that. And if you are actually doing something good for them. And you know, you you tell them that we're giving back your information record. We're trying to protect your record as much as we can, and uh, we're trying to analyze your data and trying to give you more feedback and better services based on this. They have a better, you know, appreciation on that. I that's that's my my personal point of view. Yeah, it, that, did that answer your question? That's the opportunity I feel like that's in China. Yeah, and then another thing I think is related to the culture difference, and uh, besides the political social difference between those two countries, the culture difference and uh, play the major role in this aspect as well. But I think, you know, uh, it's very, very important to have all of the data and the record and organize and put together because that is a train. But that's a lot of a challenge, big challenge. <laughs> that's the right direction to go. It's very interesting because Alex got started with the topic over there, and uh, uh, Dr. Yang Leibo was talking about uh, what uh, uh, their company is doing right now. Okay, because uh, I think our panel was specifically talking about the AI as well. So, what is artificial intelligence? What well, we know, the artificial intelligence has been considered and definitely immediately when you talk to the regular people, they are talking about, yeah, automotive, okay? And automobile, uh, advertising, and uh, 
you know, selling and uh, a lot of things that they can talk about. And also, we know in the industry, and our industry, so sort of the healthcare and the medical industry, is really, really, really uh, took a benefit of the artificial intelligence and uh, move from the different, move from the, uh, basically, the different development uh, uh, speed right now. It's, uh, <laughs> so, well, we talk about, yeah, everybody was talking about machine learning, okay? We're talking about uh, native language processing, okay? And speech and vision, okay? They basically cover those major parts as well. You know, talking about the machine learning, people talking about the deep learning and talking about the predictive uh, analysis and uh, uh, classification. Uh, it's true. But however, we also take a look at you know, what we, uh, the society and the technology sector we're living right now is really, really, really uh, get a lot of a benefit about the whole technology integration and in our industry as well. Let me can add to this. Um, you know, what you said, your question really regards the, um, the disconnect within the Chinese medical system, right? But it actually similar, um, challenges exist in the U.S. as well. It's just we're further along in terms of, you know, IOTs and digital health, mobile health. And then, for example, you know, um, Kaiser Permanente. I mean, they have 40,000 solutions within the organization, right? So this connectability and um, interchangeability is a huge problem for these um, healthcare organizations. So how do you approach this, right? Hardware in these different systems. You, you, you have monitors for, for your glucose, for diabetics. You have other devices or software solutions for monitoring other chronic disease. You have oncology, cancer patient monitoring. So, I mean, not being able to hardware in this is a reality, right? So, I think the industry is kind of moving beyond sort of, you know, maybe natural language, the speech is the way to, to solve this. Because then you have this, this um, you know, patients, you know, people know how to ask questions in human language, right? So really kind of use this as a driver to connect all these disparate systems is really kind of the solution in the long term. Indeed. Uh, thanks for the panelists. A great uh, description, insight. Any other questions? Okay, I will ask one in the spirit of this conference. You are all entrepreneurs and... Uh, I wonder if you can, you know, go with a time capsule, go back years where you just started to want to be an entrepreneur. What kind of advice you will give? Now it's going through the journey, still in the journey, um, you know, with a lot of experience and lesson learned. What kind of advice you will tell a younger self when you just started this journey? You're talking about Stanford, okay? Actually, my enter. Uh, uh, my industrial life and the start from the time I was a scientist at Stanford Department of Medicine. Okay, at that time my group is a focus on the gene regulation to the cancer uh, cells. So that's a, a lot of a pure research. Basically, I remember the time you know I have a, a people and a sequencing the genes. Um, they tried to identify a couple of genes, and many, many years ago, we are talking about the two years, only work on one. <laughs> but these days, it's completely different speed, right? Thank you. So, uh, at the time, and uh, uh, everybody knows the geographic location of the Stanford next to the Silicon, uh, ne next to Sand Hill Road. When we published a paper, I got a call from, uh, from our money neighbor, okay? Just say, hey, we need to have uh, some idea. I want to get your opinion about this project, that project, before they make an investment. I so, said, yeah, I just uh, sort of uh, get a start interesting to uh, thinking about, and then number one, uh, you know, I really enjoy the academic, okay? And uh, I love the research. But I say, hey, there's something else I'm willing to give a try. So that's uh, because at that time, and my passion is really, really work on the hematopoietic stem cells. And I have a couple inventions, which is unrelated to my group working at Stanford. So I got distracted by two well-established Silicon Valley um, uh, executives. They said, well, she get out of Stanford, let's start the company. That's how I got started. So I really, really, now I look back and their guidance and their hand-holding 
and really helped me to get a started and a sort of a transform myself from an academic environment to the industrial culture. It's a completely different, number one. And the number two is that, uh, uh, you know, you got to, uh, definitely in the academic, the, your basic interest is uh, uh, publish a paper, right? <laughs> get a result of publish a paper and get more grant. Okay. Same thing, money. But however, in the industrial world, the getting money is a little bit different. Am I frustrated? I look at it the earlier years because uh, uh, you got to put a business plan together and I try to raise money. Uh, no, I just feel there's something else and I never tried in that, that time, okay? I really enjoyed and uh, perhaps uh, not a too much trouble, but a little trouble we got money in. Okay, but that's a sort of a rewarding. And also you feel it's a different uh, uh, devotion. The when everybody knows and when you as a graduate student and how, <laughs> how horrible you work on your hours in the lab, okay, in our field. But it's the same thing in the startup. It, because you have your passion, okay, you get involved in that. That's something I want to do and then just like you're back to your graduate student years and you don't know your hours, you just know, hey, this is the direction, that's what I achieved little by little, okay? Even the problem, that's how the culture I established in uh, my three companies, okay? I said, well, it's very, very important that people work together, utilize each other's talent, okay? And we identify the problem, we solve the problem. If that's a problem there, do not do finger pointing because it's a waste of your time. Okay, let's figure out and how to get this resolved so we move forward. That's how we best utilize our time. So, um, well, and also my large corporation experience is a little bit different because I, from academic to industry and a startup to a large company and back to startup again, okay? It's a, uh, it's a different, let's put it this way. And, uh, but however, it's a very important, I just, told myself, okay, it's very important to identify what you want to do. No matter you're in the academic or industry or even in the Capitol Hill. <laughs> you know, so it is very important to follow your passion, uh, number one. And uh, number two, um, number two is uh, if you are passionate, you get a uh, just sort of a, a what, what should I say? I lost my train of thought. So, uh, and another thing is that uh, if you believe that's uh, you want to do, normally you can do well, okay? When you do well, you will enjoy more about what you are doing. So always remember people around you, they have a special skills which you may not have or you do, but however, they can deliver much better results. Be respectful is very important. That's how you got the team together to increase the efficiency and deliver the best results towards your goal. Thank you. That's really great advice. So um, my career uh, trajectory was kind of interesting because my, both my parents are actually physicians. So um, they really wanted me to go to medicine. But I was like, I want to do s stuff to scale, right? You know, being a doctor, you kind of treat patients one at a time. But if you're developing a new drug, you can actually treat, you know, benefit a lot of people. So that's kind of, I got into um, biotech. So I um, always kind of had that entrepreneur streak. So I was actually building divisions within companies for um, the first one actually was in diagnostic space, um, actually microarrays, and the company went public. And then the second one, um, again, sort of building um, the commercial capability, um, taking a company from R&D to actually commercial side. And, and that company was sold to Beckton Dickinson. And, and I realized I was really not a big company person because I could only survive in BD for six months. And then move on to this... Um, this precision medicine business that I also built from ground up. And um, again, it was kind of within a larger company. So uh, it really kind of gave me the benefit of not really, you know, being able to pay my bills and then uh, kind of hone my entrepreneurial skills. And then that company was sold for, for Novartis. So um, 
kind of, and then I kind of, you know, um, I left and did my own thing. So in terms of advice for um, wannabe entrepreneurs or current entrepreneurs, first thing is that do what you love to do, like what she said, right? And then also leverage your expertise, right? And like, for example, if I'm, I'm in healthcare, if you want me to do like, hardwire like AI technology, that's not going to be possible, right? So if you want to go that direction, like find the right team members, find right um, founding team that people complement each other's uh, um, skills. And then secondly is make sure this is what you want to do, right? Be honest with yourself because it always takes longer than you think. It always takes a lot more money than you think. So you will be always be on raising money, raising money. Think about it. If you, could, if you can miss one year of salary, would you be able to survive? Right? Plan ahead. Really be realistic with the risk uh, the entrepreneur is going to take, right? It's a 24-7 job. I mean, it's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. I mean, their glory typically is taken by, you know, the Facebook and all these other stuff, but there are like hundreds of thousands of entrepreneurs actually just, you know, the daily grind in and out, we're trying to make it work. So be honest with yourself. And then basically, I would just suggest generate a checklist, right? This one, two, three. And then whether you get everything, then you satisfy yourself and go for it, right? And if you fail, I mean, great if you succeed, right? I mean, I'm rooting for everybody, but if it does fail on the chance, you know, like nine out of 10 fail, right? And then you don't have regret, right? Because people go back to, to their previous career all the time. And then during your entrepreneurial career, you might actually find the new opportunities to take your career to a different direction. That's my advice. The first one, um, you were talking about advices as a startup life, right? And I was the first question I would say whether is that startup in China or is that startup in U.S. because the culture is so different, and whatever that you're trying to prepare yourself, it's very different as well. Um, first advice, I would say, really face yourself, and you know, and ask yourself how much can how how good is your mental resilience. Like, because that's, I, f I feel like, you know, to the end of the day, you're, you're not having any income. There's p plenty of people waiting for you to give their payment. And yet you're looking at this, like, black road in, in front of you, and you don't know which road am I supposed to take. You know, all this, like, m it's really a test on rent mental resilience, I would say. And, and people fail. Not only there, sometimes, most people, okay, there's like strategy fail, the partners was not right, the money was not enough, but to the end of the day, I feel like it's this mental resilience that whether if you can hold on to the stress with all, from all sorts of direction, that was, that's the first thing. Being a leader, you know, you wanted to sit on that position, there's certain stuff that you have to sacrifice. Second, I would say um, have an open heart. Um, especially in intelligence and big data area, you know, we're from life science background and you have to work with a lot of tech people, a lot of, you know, people from a lot of different backgrounds and sometimes the medical background and the finance background, the tech background, that's where the chaotic part and struggles from because people think differently. Um, the logic by training is very different and you guys get into wars. Um, so have an open heart and trying to, if, if you're a leader, not even have an open heart yourself, but you have to balance up between these parties and that's the hardest part. Um, yeah, so third one, there was something that I wanted to say, I couldn't remember. Um, yeah, I, I think that's the two most important, oh, and the last thing, be patient. Um, I would say start up from bio, um, life sciences, takes longer than any other industry, while your startup people like in TMT or in IOT, they're like skyrocketing within one or two years and you're just like, why am I not moving? You know, like, like it it's moves slowly and, and you're doing this frontline commercialization of this product and at the back, probably you're all investing on a streamline of product that is still on the research, trying to come out of the lab, you're waiting. There's, there's different stages, so I would say be patient, like really be patient, especially in China, because the, the whole atmosphere in China, this whole startup culture, everyone's like, I feel like I can do from coins, from blockchain, like I can do like, boom, I'm like billion year within half a year, billion year within a year, right? That's a terrible culture, especially in life science. Be patient, open heart, test your mental resilience. If you can't 
do it anymore. Maybe do a co-founder instead of the leader. You know, looking other positions instead of like always shooting for the one. I would say it's more realistic. I, ha I have one last thing to add: is don't be afraid to fail. Yeah. Because you know. Startups fail all the time. That's why you see people pivot all the time, right? I mean, look at Slack. Now it's a big unicorn, but they actually started out as a gaming company, yeah. right? So. so when we talk about uh, uh, medical data and big data nowadays, uh, there's uh, some technical issues with big data storage and transportation security all these. Uh, some company adopts the cloud solution. Some company adopts a local uh, local storage or uh, whatever. So as in my company, we face similar issues. We have uh, terabytes of data. Uh, sometimes they need to send around. Uh, through cloud, is, it, will be, it will take quite a long time because of the bandwidth limitation. And uh, frequently, we just send a hard drive, FedEx a hard drive. Um, so there's a security issue, there's convenience, all these issues. So a uh, question to the panel, how do you guys handle a uh, huge amount of data and uh, is, uh, is uh, sensitive to, to the patient? Yeah, the time when uh, we had a co collaboration with uh, BGI, actually some data is uh, sent through the hard copy. <laughs> that was years ago. Um, well, generally speaking, and we operate on, uh, through cloud and uh, we don't have uh, too much issues. But however, we're talking about a different, uh, different uh, volume of the data. I use the word of the volume. So probably they will have a better answer. So I think you probably run into a specific problem where data has to travel cross borders, right? Um, yeah, so um, for sort of within the United States, and the most company now use some AWS. I know it took Big Pharma a long time to um, migrate. I remember when I was at Novartis, we probably took like a year and a half to debate whether we should move our data to the cloud, but we did now, basically every company embraces it in, in full force, right? It's all in AWS. And for our company, Huma.ai, since we don't really, we're not like a Google or Microsoft, we want your data, and then we sometimes offer the technology solution for free in exchange for access to data, but we actually work with them that the data actually sits in their AWS. So, because we're, you know, we're a different um, architecture, different platform. Um, well, the controversy about data security and data access is actually, if, because we do artificial intelligence and big data analysis, um, and that, the efficiency of big data analysis only comes when you have a centralized storage of data. Um, but when you have a centralized storage of data, that's actually very, dangerous because no system can guarantee 100% of security. If, if the central system got attacked, then things happen. Um, so what we're looking for, well, we used to have this traditional of just centralized data center um, as a traditional business. And then now we're, um, and then we actually used cloud system as well, but then for a company, for most cost efficient way is actually use a cloud that already set up, like Alibaba, Tencent, you know, using their cloud, JD or whatever. Um, but again, you're using another infrastructure, right? No one can actually promise that's secure as well. And now moving into this blockchain era, we're actually looking into the blockchain solution. That's where you can move into distributed type of data, but then again, Blockchain has its limitation as well because once you put all the data into a distributed type of storage data, then you don't get as much as the efficiency if you wanted to do big data mining. But we are looking, we're actually building, looking into this blockchain solution for giving the data back to individual because that storage space is actually efficient, like good enough for your specific record giving yourself on blockchain. We're still under development. Um, that's our solution. I don't know what particular problem that you have encountered, so I would say you really need individual solution for individual um, data problem. But again, you know, you don't have, that's, that's the controversy between data storage and data security and using blockchain and not using blockchain, blockchain versus central storage, I would say, yeah. 
I have one more thing to add. Just for industry trend is that um, you know these big pharma companies are actually spending billions in the so-called automation, right? System integration. So um, you know there, a lot of them are working with like big companies like Google or uh, Microsoft or um, Amazon to sort of doing this um, you know data integration, data lake, and things like that. Thank you so much. And also, I realized someone very wisely told me, not only, you are an extrovert, extrovert, but you should be conscious about introvert. So what I will do is I'll thank the panelists, and the formal session is over. So among the people who are introverts, you can come to ask questions more intimately instead of you have to stand up among the audience. So thank the panelists again. Thank you.